Hey, Liz Whitaker and Liz Whitaker students. How you guys doing? Um, thought I would share a poem from my third book, Damnatio Memore. Um, it's Latin and it means damned memory. And I thought if I had a pretentious Latin title, I would sell more copies, but that didn't work. But anyway, yeah. Um, this poem is kind of about a, a weird family tradition. I don't know if anyone in the class grew up poor, but uh, it was kind of this thing in my family that when someone did something for someone else, you would never say thank you. You would say, oh, it's okay. Like, like, yeah. So I wanted to write a poem about that topic, and this is what came out. Dedication. In our house, not once did we hear someone say, you're welcome, an answer to thanks. Instead, it's all right. Backhanded reminder of the sacrifice of this or that dollar store trinket cost folks well below the poverty line. This is a hard habit to break. Don't worry, it's fine when you thank me for helping you move furniture, for coming to your reading, your wedding, your beloved's funeral. Oh, it's all right. To students, when they thank me for margin comments, for letting them turn in assignments half a semester late, it's all right. The door held open a few seconds longer for the jock on crutches, for the blue-eyed girl breathing into the straw fixed to her wheelchair. I want to thank the moon for tilting in time to highlight the rain spilling off a parked windshield, my body for keeping itself free so far from cancer, diabetes, suicide. I want to thank my fear of death for melting whenever a beautiful woman bends to drink from a fountain. I want to thank the crows for mating at any windowsill but mine. And their answer, rising in chorus with each day's rusty sunset. It's all right, it's all right, it's all right. Uh, in terms of what I can talk about with this poem, I guess one thing is where the imagery came from. Uh, basically, it wasn't like I was sitting around one day and these are all the things that happened in one day. Uh, basically, uh, it's a, a pretty girl drinking from a fountain or someone on crutches or, you know, birds making a racket. All these different things are just things that I saw or experienced at different points and kind of just made a, a, a note of it. I figured, well, I'll work that in eventually. Uh, which kind of gets to a point I always tell my students. Um, have you ever heard the phrase, pray without ceasing? Right? The way to know God is to pray without ceasing. Well, one time I had a student say, well, I like the class, but how do I become a better writer? You know, we never discussed how you literally become a better writer. Uh, and actually, it's, it's simple, but it's not easy. And that's write without ceasing. And I don't mean literally you sit there writing and never stopping. Uh, but I mean, you always think in the back of your mind, how would you describe whatever you're seeing? So it doesn't have to be anything ele ele elevated. It can be uh, you're in line at Taco Bell um, and someone's saying something stupid or silly or kind of sweet and you just kind of make a note of it, plug it in the back of your brain and think, okay, at some point I'm going to try and incorporate this uh, wherever it, it feels right in the poem or a story or essay or whatever. Um, one other thing to talk about, I suppose, is line breaks. This is something that a lot of people have trouble with. Like, where do you break your lines in poetry? Um, if you ask 10 people, you get 10 different answers. But when I do this, I guess I try to break so that there'll be some kind of double meaning or some kind of extra tension with the break. Um, see if I can find an example. Uh, yeah. Um, the door held open a few seconds longer for the jock on crutches, okay, for the blue-eyed girl breathing line break. Uh, so, if I just read that line by itself, hopefully, the reader will be like, oh, for someone breathing. Okay, that's, are you holding your breath? Um, are you nervous? Are you excited? Or is it just like a natural moment? And then you get to the next line, oh, into the straw fixed her wheelchair. So, it goes from a scene of just someone taking a breath or holding their breath uh, to a, something entirely different. Um, and it kind of like... The goal, I suppose, is to kind of pull the rug out from under the reader's feet, but in a good way. Um, let's see if I can find another one. Uh, this one isn't really a double meaning, but even a couple lines later. I want to thank the moon for tilting. Okay, in time to highlight the rain. Okay, rain where? Where are you?
where's the rain? Oh, okay. Spilling off the parking windshield. So I, when you brake on rain, you get the image of the rain being highlighted, but you don't know what it's being highlighted on. So if I were to move a couple of the words up, and time to highlight the rain spilling off, oh, spilling off what? The emphasis would be on what the rain is hitting, not the actual rain, if that makes sense. Uh, so a lot of times where you put your brakes, it's just where you would have a natural pause. Um, you want the reader to stop and think about things a little bit more. And for me, I think that's the main difference between poetry and prose. Uh, I'm also a fiction writer, and I love writing fiction. I love nonfiction as well. Uh, but the extra tool that you have when you're working with poetry is line breaks. So even if you have narrative poetry, which is uh, poetry telling a story, which is what most of my poetry does, um, even if you have that, you can still use the line breaks to add a little bit more pause. Whereas if I were to, you know, take all the line breaks out of this and just make it like a story or a paragraph, I would read it faster, you know, because I have to like pause for an eighth of a second after each one of these words. Um, so it adds a little more energy, but then you lose the energy you get from the line breaks. If that makes sense. Um, another kind of a rule, I guess, with line breaks is you have to decide whether you want to end on a weak word or start on a weak word, right? For example, let's see. You know, if I had examples before I said this, it would be a lot easier. Okay, yeah. Um, fourth, third, fourth line from the bottom. On any windowsill but mine, and their answer rising in chorus. Okay, and is not a very strong word. So some people would say, I should have written it so it says, on any window so but mine and line break or, or, or uh, and there line break answer rising in chorus because answer is a, a little bit stronger word um, that's one that's one school of thought I don't really agree because uh, I think whatever word you have at the end of a line that's the word that the reader thinks about for an extra like eighth of a second while they're lowering their eyes to the next line so um, if I, I usually say if you have an A and the uh, in, like a, a not very cool word, but you just need it in the story or in the poem, uh, you move that down to the beginning of the next line. Um, what else? The ending. Every once in a while someone will ask me, why did I end the poem this way? Um, I don't have the faintest idea. Because uh, I think... If you're, if you're writing and you're doing it right, whatever that means, um, you're kind of doing it on autopilot. So you internalize all these different lessons and then you just do it. And then if the ending or the story or the turn or the character or whatever feels right, then it probably feels right because internally on some level you're recognizing that it's, it's metaphorical and it means 10 different things. But if you held a gun in my head, could I explain all 10 of these things right away? Probably not. Um, because if I could explain it, I would be reciting the whole poem or the whole story or whatever it is. Uh, so basically, one other rule that I have is that when I'm writing a poem, I look for a way to get off the stage as fast as possible. You know, um, Whenever I reach uh, an image that seems to mean a little bit more than just what it seems to mean on the surface, you know, some kind of deeper metaphor uh, that some part of my crazy, stupid brain understands, but the rest doesn't. Um, I usually just try to trust that. And then how do you test that and make sure it's right? You just keep reading it over and over again. Then you get feedback. So um, being in a class where you can get workshop feedback or have a couple friends whose opinions you trust, uh, you kind of use it all as a test audience. So yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, hope that was helpful. Take care, guys.